In this podcast, we'll be going on to look at the key sections of the Family Law Act and how family courts approach these sections to make decisions in parenting cases about children. So the key sections of the Family Law Act are section 60, capital B, 60 CA, 60 CC, subsections 2 and 3, 61 DA and 65 DAA. Now, after the amendments to the Family Law Act in 2006, the approach to how the court decides parenting cases changed quite markedly. And it was because of the insertion of these sections and also because of the addition of Section 61DA, which provides a presumption for equal shared parental responsibility. It has meant that the law has become more complicated and you'll see in this module that even for people studying law or for lawyers, it's quite hard to follow the steps that the court has to work through. So we will work through these sections one by one and then we'll have a look at how the court approaches them. Okay, so firstly looking at the sections and explaining them. And as I'm having a look at them, it would be good to have them in front of you. So have a look at section 60B. This is called the Objects and Principles. I guess it's really an overarching section. It's intended to really be, uh, or sorry, to set out the key principles that the court has to take into account when making orders about children. Now at the very outset you see that the first objects are ensuring that children have the benefit of both parents having, sorry, the benefit of both their parents having a meaningful involvement in their lives to the maximum extent consistent with the best interests of the child and protecting children from physical or psychological harm from being subjected to or exposed to abuse, neglect or family violence. Now those first two objects and principles, which are the very start of uh, many more, and I haven't set them out on that slide, so have a look at them yourselves, but there are many more there to have a look at. These two really reflect some key concepts which are in this Part 7 parenting area of the Family Law Act. Also, this um, idea of ensuring children have the benefit of, of both their parents having a meaningful involvement in, of their lives comes from the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And I guess is subject to this being in their best interests and that they will be safe. And that's why we have the next paragraph about protecting children from harm. Now the objects and principles really provide the overarching principles that the court takes into account. And in the initial, um, this is one of the initial cases after the 2006 amendments to the Family Law Act that introduced these sections. In this case of good and good, the full court of the Family Court said, the objects and principles contained in section 60B provide the context in which the factors in section 60CC which we'll have a look at in, in a minute, are to be examined, weighed and applied in the individual case. So if you have a look at the cases, you'll see that the judge, as he works through or as she works through the sections, will just briefly mention section 60B at the beginning and say something like, um, I'm taking into account the following sections in the context of the objects and principles in section 60b. Now the next uh, section is something that has really stayed quite consistent through amendments to the Family Law Act that have occurred over many years. For example in 1995, then in 2006 and most recently in 2011. The most stable concept in the Family Law Act has been that the best interests of the child are paramount. So this is something that is really what the court is 
having regard to when making orders for children. They must regard the best interests of the child as the paramount consideration. However, I guess the problem for the court is what are the best interests of the child and how do we work them out? And this is where the section 60 CC, uh, what we call best interest factors, come into play. So it's the best interest factors in section 60 CC which guide the court and the judge works through the best interest factors one by one, applies the factors that are relevant to the facts of the case and makes finding about each makes findings about each relevant best interests factors. Now in 2006 uh, introduced into the Act was an idea of a two-tiered approach to these best interest factors. They're called the primary considerations which are contained in uh, 60 CC2 and 2 capital A and then the additional considerations contained in section 60 CC3. Now you will find when you have a look at them, and probably a good idea to have a look at them now, that really some of the section 60 CC3 additional considerations inform the court about findings in relation to the primary considerations. And I'll go on to explain that now. So the primary considerations are the benefit to the child of having a meaningful relation with both parents and the need to protect the child from harm. Now as you'll see that they echo, echo the first two objects and principles that were set out in section 60 capital B. Now these were inserted in 2006 and it did cause a bit of a problem for the court that there was no guidance as how they were to prioritise um, A and B. For example was A more important or was B more important. This um, I guess led and the research has showed us that generally in the community and for some of the judges in the way they applied these sections that they were giving priority to section 2A. That was the benefit to the child of having a meaningful relationship with both parents. I guess what this meant was that sometimes when there were concerns and evidence about uh, the need to protect a child from harm that the meaningful relationship with the parent was being prioritised and the criticism being that sometimes judges weren't make, uh, making appropriate orders providing appropriate pr protection for children. Uh, as a result of this in 2011 further amendments to the Family Law Act were enacted to provide further protection for victims of violence and abuse. This subsection 2 capital A was inserted which said when the court is applying these primary condition sorry primary condition considerations to A and B the court is to give greater weight to the protection from harm consideration in subsection 2B. Now as we go through these slides I have put in yellow, highlighted in yellow, the uh, provisions that were inserted in the amendments in 2011 to the Family Law Act. There is research happening at the moment uh, by the Australian Institute of Family Studies on whether these amendments have had an impact in practice. The report is due to come out in August. Uh, so uh, if the report comes out in time we might be able to include it in the module about the social science research that's coming up later in the semester. Now those were the primary considerations then in the best interest factors that the court has to work through there are also the additional considerations. So have a look at them because they are also are quite lengthy. Now in applying the facts to a case a judge has to work through each one, work out if it's relevant and if it's relevant apply it to the facts and make a finding. Now the first one is any views expressed by the child 
and you'll see also and any factors such as the child's maturity or level of understanding that the court thinks are relevant to the weight it should give to a child's views. So that's the first additional consideration. Now there's no particular age in family law in Australia when a child can express views. I guess obviously um, as a child gets older they might be more inclined to express views, although some children are feel quite caught in the middle between their parents and don't want to take sides. Whereas on the other hand, some uh, particularly young people, teenagers, have very strong uh, opinions and want to put that forward as to, for example, which parent they would want to live with or whether they would feel comfortable in a shared care arrangement. Another one, uh, paragraph B, is the nature of the relationship of the child with the parents, mum and dad, and any other people, for example, grandparents or relatives. So that really depends on the circumstances and how close children are to other, um, for example, to grandparents and relatives as to whether that would be taken into account. Another one, uh, C, involvement with the child. This one was introduced in 2011 and it replaced what had previously been called the Friendly Parent Provision. The Friendly Parent Provision had been inserted in 2006 and, ba and basically left a parent o open to criticism if they didn't facilitate time between the child and the other parent, even if they were concerned about the child's safety because of violence or um, possible abuse. This led to concerns uh, and that some people, I guess, were entering into arrangements that weren't safe for their children. For example, fe feeling coerced into a, a contact arrangement between a child and the other parent without having adequate supervision. That friendly parent provision has been deleted and in its place is this provision where the extent to which the parents have taken or failed to take the opportunity to participate in decisions about the child is taken into account. And sorry, also have a look at subsection CA which I haven't got on the slide but it says the extent to which each of the child's parents has fulfilled or failed to fulfill the parents obligations to maintain the child so for example, uh, that could take into account uh, paying financial support for a child. Going back to paragraph C, it also uh, talks about, and actually uh, I probably have, shouldn't have that insert there for um, subsections 2 and 3, they should all be in a row, because it also talks about the extent to which each of the parents has taken or failed to take the opportunity to spend time with the child and to communicate with the child. So that's quite a different section. Paragraph H uh, talks about taking into account Aboriginal or Torres Strait Island heritage uh, and um, that has certainly been taken into account in some of the reported cases. Subsection I talks about the attitude of parents to the responsibility of parenthood as demonstrated by them. Have a look too at paragraph F which talks about the capacity of parents and other relatives to provide for the needs of the child including emotional and intellectual needs. Also have a look at uh, subpara G that talks about the maturity, sex, lifestyle and background, culture and traditions of the child and parents. Going on to uh, J, any family violence involving the child or a member of the child's family and K if there are any family violence orders and you'll see on that slide it also takes into account the nature of the order, the circumstances in which it was made. For example, is it an interim order, that is an order until further order, a temporary order, 
or is it a final order that's been made after a full um, hearing with oral evidence? And uh, the very last two are L, whether it would be preferable to make the order that would least likely lead to the institution of further proceedings. That one can be important because sometimes when parents are fighting over a child, they might, uh, one parent might take the child for a holiday and not return them. They might leave a, live a distance from the other parent. They might enrol the child in a new school. And then the court really has to weigh up what's been the, um, the time frame, how long has the child been at the new school. They really have to then try and weigh up whether they, they should make uh, another change. And finally, M, any other fact or circumstance that, stance that the court thinks is relevant. So have a look at all of them. You should become familiar with them because uh, if you do get a parenting uh, question in the exam, you will be required to work through the sections that we're talking about in this podcast and also you'll be required to apply the relevant primary and additional considerations. Now I guess initially when all these sections came in, even though, and we just go back to look at the key sections, uh, the courts were aware that there were these key parenting sections, but there was really no guidance in the Act as to how to apply them or in what order to apply them. So that then uh, in 2006, when the sections had just come into being, was a bit of a dilemma for the court. There was a question about whether the section, um, and sorry, how the primary and additional considerations work together. It had been clear when Parliament was talking about the bill that passed this leg legislation that they were saying that additional considerations didn't mean that they are, were of any less importance than the primary. So how did they work together? And in this case of Colu and Ronaldo um, in paragraph 335, the court suggested uh, that perhaps it would be a good idea for the judge to work through the additional considerations before looking at the primary considerations and they took this approach from a 2007 case, Mazursky and Albright. Now I have to say, uh, when you actually look at the case law and because we have cases in the Federal Circuit Court and in the Family Court, uh, different judges take different approaches to this, these sections. But in this unit, we're going to be looking at what um, we're going to put forward as the ideal approach. And then you can use that approach, for example, if you are answering uh, a parenting question in the exam. So we've looked at section 60B, section 60CA, which was about best interests of paramount, section 60CC, which was about the best interest factors, and that there are primary and additional considerations. After the court works through all of those sections, it then goes on to consider the section 61DA presumption, which is generally that there is a presumption that the parents will have equal shared parental responsibility. That is, that the mother and father will each consult each other about major long-term decisions for a child. So that's the general presumption, but then the court has to decide whether that is the case and they'll apply the presumption, whether it does not apply in the particular fact, um, circumstances or whether it is rebutted. Now I guess that's where uh, things get a little bit more complicated. And I'll just go on to the slide about the presumption. So you'll see that uh, generally we apply the presumption, but remember this is a court hearing, so it's not going to be it's not going to be a case where pa often parents have been able to get along. The sorts of cases that now go to hearings in family courts 
often have very complex um, issues. For example, there might be serious uh, issues of violence by one parent to another, allegations of child abuse, there may even be uh, uh, findings of child abuse by the Department of Child Safety or by the police. So it's not always a case when it goes to court where it's appropriate for both parents to have equal decision-making in relation to major long-term issues. You'll see, breaking up that section 61DA, that the presumption um, does not apply or the court can find that it does not apply if there are reasonable grounds to believe that a parent of a child or a person who lives with a parent, such as a new partner, has engaged in abuse of the child or another child in the family or family violence. And remember in the GNC case where the father was in jail, that was 2A, abuse of the two older daughters of the father's previous relationship that was used for the judge to say the presumption did not apply. If it's an interim hearing, that is a hearing working out orders until there can be a final hearing, the court can um, decide that it would not be appropriate for the presumption to, to be applied. Or you'll see there's a final um, subsection 4, it may be rebutted by evidence that satisfies the court that it would not be in the best interest of the child for the parents to have equal shared parental responsibility. That uh, can uh, cover, for example, very high conflict between parents. So remember the context of these particular cases. They have often got very extreme um, issues arising in them. And that's why the court has the decision to make about whether the presumption of equal shared parental responsibility will apply. Now, Going back to where we were, we were talking about the presumption. If the presumption then applies, the court then has to go on to consider section 65 DAA and have a look at the flow chart that I've put up on the Blackboard site. It takes you through these sections step by step. You can take it into the exam and it really guides you as to in what order the court must consider the sections. And now the first case that considered how the section should be considered was that 2006 case of good and good. In that case, and I've summarised the approach here, it was dealing with an interim parenting hearing. And it is still cited as the um, way the court will approach an interim parenting hearing. Now, I've put that case up on the website and it's also in the case book. Now, the approach of the court is set out in more detail and I've just probably missed out a couple of the first steps on that slide. But have a look here. How should interim proceedings be conducted? It's set out at paragraph 81 to 82 of the judgment and you should... Um, take a copy of that or just um, read through that because that's really probably one of the most commonly cited cases in court because the court deals with many more interim hearings than final hearings and you'll just see the first couple of steps identifying the competing proposals of the parties, identifying the issues in dispute. So when we talk about competing proposals that will be what parenting orders they are seeking. For example, uh, say mum is seeking dad have every second weekend with the child and dad is seeking 50-50. That's their competing pr proposals. Identifying the issues in dispute. For example, uh, what um, allegations are the parties putting forward, for example? Are there any allegations of uh, violence or abuse? identifying any agreed or uncontested relevant facts. So that might be facts that the parties agree on. Uh, they might both agree that uh, the, the child is, um, for example, seven years old and they're in a certain grade at school and that they're doing well at school. And 
and then have a look at the rest of those uh, steps which um, are the same as the ones on the slide. So that's the approach for interim hearings and I guess really it's the approach that is then adopted for final hearings. And it was this case, good and good, that really gave the courts of guidance about the order in which to apply these sections and particularly uh, this agreed for example and and I guess Colo and Ronaldo was a later case but that you would look at section 60 CC best interest factors before you look at the presumption and whether it applies. So going back to uh, where we were, we were looking at that approach which is from good and good and have a look at the flow chart I've um, drawn up for you on the blackboard site and hopefully that will also make these steps a little bit clearer for you. Now this Taylor and Barker really just supports this view that uh, the best interest factors in section 60 CC are considered and worked through before the presumption in section 61 DA. Now in this case which is full court of the family court the court said that this approach was recommended but not mandated and you will see that some judges don't take that approach and that they do consider the presumption in section 61 DA first However, I guess in this unit, we consider that the best approach is to work through section 60 CC and then consider the presumption in section 61 DA. Now in Connock, sorry, Colu and Ronaldo, again, being a later case in 2010, what they said at paragraph 140 was uh, we are of the view that ordinarily a consideration of the relevant matters in section 60 CC would be undertaken before a concluded view could be formed that the presumption of equal shared parental responsibility applied. That does not mean that such a finding could not be made at an early stage of reasons for judgment provided it was clear that it was made having regard to findings made in relation to the section 60 CC considerations. So all that, all that really means is it's supporting that view that we're saying is the better approach. Now the other um, aspect that has been considered in the case law to a large extent is in the primary considerations when it talks about the benefit of a child having a meaningful relationship with their parent or the parent having a meaningful relationship with their child. There was no guidance in the Family Law Act as to what meaningful relationship actually meant. In that case of GNC which we've looked at a bit in these mod in, sorry, in Module 4, Her Honor Justice Bennett said the court must evaluate the nature and quality of the relationship to establish whether there is any benefit to the child in having or continuing a relationship and whether such relationship is or will be meaningful in the relevant sense. Now the context of that remember was the father in jail for sexual abuse of his two older daughters. He was making an application for his son who was seven to come and visit him in jail. So that really gives you the context of um, in that case why it was so important for the court to consider whether there was any benefit to the child. Now in that case the, uh, the child was interviewed by a family report writer and the family report writer who is a social scientist also wrote a report to the court about whether the child wanted to see his father. 
Uh, the family consultant said, although his limited recollections of the father are positive, the child does not want to see his father as he recognises that it would upset his mother. He appeared keen to maintain indirect communication and indicated that he would like to receive letters, cards and presents. He seems insightful and recognises that these indirect forms of communication are less problematic for him to manage. Now what um, the court actually ordered, or Her Honour Justice Bennett was, that at, um, at the time the father not have visits with the child and not have telephone or direct communication, apart from as set out in these orders. He said the father could uh, send the child letters, cards or presents on three occasions each year and set out particular times, for example, around the time of his birthday. Uh, the judge also made an order that once in every 12-month period the supervising family consultant speak to the child by telephone to ascertain whether he is at that time seeking any communication or time with his father. Now at the time of the court hearing the child was seven, so you can imagine uh, his his views may or may not change as he gets older, uh, can understand more, but also can make up his own mind about whether he wants to have a relationship with his father. So that's an interesting case. And that um, approach has been followed in many subsequent cases. So Her Honour said, this requires the court to evaluate the extent to which a meaningful or significant relationship with both parents was going to advantage a child. And she's really there taking a child-focused approach. Uh, what benefit will there be to the child? In Mazorsky and Albright, they talked about uh, this term in a bit more detail. They said, and sorry, um, Justice Brown said, uh, meaningful when used in the context of meaningful relationship is synonymous with significant, important or of consequence. A meaningful relationship is one which is important, significant and valuable to the child. It is a qualitative adjective, not a strictly quantitative one. Now what this means is it's about quality, not quantity of time. And I think this case was a relocation case where for example, a parent wants to move further away from another parent. So, and, and this is really um, supported by the social science research that's, that when children are interviewed about this, they really emphasise the quality of time rather than the quantity of time. And particularly if the relationship is not working well for them, more time with that particular parent, for example, if they're not child focused or if they're violent and abusive, will be uh, even worse for a child. Uh, but you will find that, say, in our legal system, we really focus on quantity and quantifying time and talking in terms of time. But remember, too, uh, when we're negotiating parenting cases, it's not just about physical time, it's also about maintaining a relationship, and that can happen um, by, for example, phone calls or Skype contact. And sometimes parents do move away from each other, uh, sometimes for no rhyme or reason, but other times often now for work. And it's just not possible for um, the child to see both of them equal, if it's, for example, for equal times or every weekend or every second weekend. And uh, quality for children is more important than quantity. Although I guess on the other hand, obviously uh, quantity will have an impact on, um, and if it's a positive relationship, on how close people can be. Now in Godfrey and Sanders, uh, the court also talked about this quality and quantity. Even if a parent is moving and it results in a reduction of the quality of the relationship, or the quality, sorry, the, and they probably also mean the quantity of time. What the Family Law Act aspires to promote is a meaningful relationship, not an optimal one. And you'll find that a lot in the cases that we deal with. Uh, once parents have separated, it's no longer an optimal 
arrangement for a child, there are many dis disadvantages to a child having to move between parents and particularly if uh, parents end up a long way away from each other it makes them things even more difficult. Now finally in this case of Cave and Cave I just wanted to uh, point out what Justice Benjamin had a bit of a checklist there of what to look for in relation to a meaningful relationship and this is in the context of similar facts to GNC where a parent and in this case the father was in jail. So have a look at uh, that checklist because I guess um, I guess you can probably understand in that particular context that Justice Benjamin was wanting to be more rigorous which with what he looked at when looking at whether the relationship could be meaningful. Now in the text in the reading we also have a case of McCall and Clark that sets out three different approaches to meaningful relationship. Don't worry about this for this module, I think that gets more complex. We'll just stick with the GNC test which has been used in subsequent cases. Now remember uh, once the court goes through all of the best interest factors it then has to look at whether the presumption applies or does not apply or is rebutted. Uh, if the court decides that the presumption applies it then has to go on to consider section 65 DAA. Now firstly the court must consider whether equal time is appropriate. It must be in the child's best interests and reasonably practicable. Now it's in this section uh, which I call a time trigger where I guess people got the idea that these amendments that happened in 2006 really meant a presumption of equal time. So it's only if the presumption applies the court has to then go on and consider firstly equal time, whether it's in the child's best interests and reasonably practicable. If it's found not to be and note it has to be in the best interests and reasonably practicable, the judge then has to go and consider substantial and significant time and again if it's in the child's best interests and reasonably practicable. And Good and Good talked about what this word consider in section 65 DAA meant. And have a look if you've got the case book, there's a specific extract about this. So what they said is um, there was a need to consider positively the making of an order if the conditions in section 65 DAA were met. And uh, for example, equal time must be in the best interests of the child and reasonably practicable. And uh, same for a consideration of whether it's substantial and significant time, you have to go through those steps. Now reasonable practicability is really based on the social science research and is set out in section 65 DAA sub subsection 5. These are really factors that have showed up in the research as really being needed if parents are going to implement a shared time arrangement. For example, some people have a one week on, one week off arrangement. Generally it works okay if parents live close to each other, they can cooperate and collaborate to make the agreement work, they're child focused and they can communicate, the child can cope with the arrangement, and I guess the child is of an appropriate age to cope with the arrangement as well. So there have to be a whole um, list of, of characteristics that need to be present and you know obviously um, people don't have to live very close by to each other but it does become problematic because a common thing that happens is that um, children will leave things in one parent's house, go to the other parent's house and unless they've got two of everything uh, and sometimes the problem is the the school books although in the way of the future with um, using iPads and laptops that might no longer be the case if say for example textbooks are put on to them but just leaving things behind for example their their um, football jersey or their swimming togs or their 
uh, ballet costume or their football shoes, that sort of thing. It can be quite difficult if people just don't live quite close to each other so that they can pop around and get something that's really needed for an activity during the week. And we will look at all of that more in our uh, module on the social science research. Now, the case of MRR and GR was the most significant case about this section and it concerned parents that had moved from Sydney to Mount Isa due to the father's work. Uh, the parents had separated and the mother wanted to return to Sydney to live. The father was working for a mining company the mother did not have employment in Mount Isa, although she had um, had employment in Sydney. The father was wanting an equal time arrangement and he wanted the child to remain living in Mount Isa and for the equal time arrangement to work around his shifts at the mining company. Now originally uh, when the first instance judge considered it, the father was successful. However, on appeal, uh, it was overturned and the significance to us is that the court said that when the court is considering whether equal time is appropriate or substantial and significant time it has to be in the child's best interests and reasonably practicable so you need to show both and also uh, reasonable practicability is not just from the child's perspective but also from the mother's perspective in this particular case and for example the mother had given evidence that because Mount Isa was a mining town uh, the accommodation was very expensive she couldn't find suitable accommodation she couldn't find employment uh, particularly employment that worked around the father's roster that she was uh, depressed in Mount Isa that if she returned to Sydney she had family support and could find a job and all of that had to be taken into account So the court must now make a specific finding that the child spending time with the parents is also reasonably practicable in, a sorry, in, a court, uh, sorry, in addition to being in the best interests. And from this case, uh, the authority is the court has no power to make an order for equal time or substantial and, si and significant time unless a positive finding about reasonable practicability is made. So that was an interesting one. Uh, what was being reported at conferences was that subsequent to this case the mother actually ended up staying in Mount Isa as she found a boyfriend there so that was quite interesting if that was actually the case. Now finally for this podcast uh, a case about substantial and significant time and it really mimics the section section 65 DAA3 that lets us know what substantial and significant time is and the idea of this in the Family Law Act was that to get away from the what used to happen in the past with uh, one parent being the primary carer for the child and then the other parent being like the good time parent that only saw the child on weekends. The idea was and the social science research tells us that ideally it, it's best for children if both parents are involved in not just uh, weekend and fun routine but day-to-day -day routine, school, discipline, getting them to do homework, that that's really ideal and obviously that, may, that, that can only happen when parents live in uh, geographic pr proximity to each other. Okay well that's all for that podcast, it is quite a complicated area of the law so if you have any questions or need anything um, made clearer, please bring it along uh, to our in-person workshop or email me.